Good morning. I want to express my thanks to Margaret and uh, the Municipal Arts Society for inviting me here today. Uh, MAS has always been at the forefront of convening diverse interests and experts from around the city to confront and develop solutions to the challenges New York City faces, from preserving Grand Central Terminal to assuring the liveliness of Times Square to preventing a terrible mistake at Columbus Circle. MAS has been the conscience of the city and its physical environment. Now, with this collection of essays and ideas that Margaret referred to, and that I hope you all have read, you are helping the city create a roadmap for future action rather than simply reacting to potential municipal missteps. I'm really um, honored to be here among so many friends and colleagues, uh, first from the administration, I know Kyle Kimball is going to be on the next panel, and he's here already, and Polly Trottenberg will be here later. Um, and I see in the audience Anna Levin, who is one of our uh, distinguished uh, members of the City Planning Commission, so now I have to be especially careful about what I, what I say, and I think I'm going to cross out about half my remarks, Anna, because uh, uh, I know you'll be watching. And I also want to... Um, uh, note that my former colleagues from HRNA are here, some of them are here, and they, they were uh, instrumental in uh, managing talking transitions, which really was in some respects a curtain raiser on the de Blasio administration and highlighted what we all recognize is a, a profound challenge for the city, which is uh, uh, the, the affordable housing crisis. And one of the things that tra Talking Transitions showed was that the affordable housing crisis exists literally in every neighborhood, every community board district, rich, poor, and middle class in New York. I also, I don't know if he's here yet, but want to recognize um, Council Member Brad Lander. Uh, m really much of my recent thinking about neighborhood planning has been greatly influenced by, by Brad. Um, for me, it is a particularly a delight to be back in my uh, old Hudson Square neighborhood where I spent several years overseeing Trinity Church's substantial real estate holdings, including this building where Raphael Vignoli is uh, among Trinity's most distinguished tenants I wish I could claim responsibility for bringing uh, Raphael Vignoli to Hudson Square, but um, uh, I have to admit, alas, that he preceded me, but um, was a pioneer in the transformation of, uh, of this neighborhood that's now underway. Hudson Square, I think, is in just an excellent example of how city neighborhoods are constantly changing. This one from farmland 300 years ago to a suburb of Lower Manhattan to a thriving waterfront district to the 20th century's premier printing district, which I recall helping to reaffirm 30 years ago as a super M zone forever called the Graphic Art Center, um, and once again showing that very few things in the city are forever, uh, because now this neighborhood has been transformed in today's, into today's creative media center, and thanks to a unique rezoning by the City Planning Commission a few years ago to tomorrow's mixed-use manufacturing live-work community. And I know Ellen Baer, who is the uh, president of the Hudson Square Connection, Hudson Square's Business Improvement District, has also been in the forefront of that change. Um, the themes and ideas for new leadership link closely to the approach the de Blasio administration and the Department of City Planning are taking. Integrated planning strategies are a focus of Mayor de Blasio's Housing New York Plan. As you all know by now, the de Blasio administration is committed to providing 200,000 affordable apartments over the next 10 years through a combination of preservation and new development. The 115-page plan, which was created through coordination among 13 agencies, 
and with input from more than 200 individual stakeholders, outlines 50 plus initiatives that accelerate affordable housing construction, protect tenants, and deliver more value from affordable housing investments in a manner that distributes development more equitably throughout the five boroughs. It is the most ambitious housing program ever undertaken by this or any other city or state. We envision that the total cost of the plan over the next 10 years will exceed $40 billion, with the city providing approximately $8 billion and the remainder coming mostly from private sector investment, but from the federal and state governments as well. 40% of the 200,000 affordable units will be new construction, which means we will have to produce an average of 8,000 units of affordable housing per year over the life of this plan. And that's a 60% increase over the average annual new construction of affordable housing produced during Mayor Bloomberg's administration. So you can see that we are being quite ambitious. We're expanding the number of units for extremely low-income households by 200%, as well as increasing the number of moderate-income units by 50%. The plan is also promoting more units for homeless families and for seniors, as well as supportive and accessible housing for those in need. We recognize that for developers and businesses, time is money. The city, particularly city planning and HPD, are committed to making the permitting and approval process more efficient. We are also reviewing zoning and building code regulations such as reducing parking requirements for affordable housing in transit-oriented areas where car ownership is low, alleviating building envelope constraints, and reducing minimum sizes of units for seniors. All of these, we believe, could lower the cost of construction. And as a former applicant to the city planning department myself, I can say that uh, I share with many uh, of you um, the re reality that time is money and the more efficiently we can do our job, the cheaper the cost for everyone. We will also be implementing a mandatory inclusionary zoning requirement as part of all future rezonings that substantially increase potential housing capacity in medium and high density areas. This will require that a portion of the new housing developed in these rezoned areas be permanently affordable to low and or moderate income households in order to ensure more diverse and inclusive communities and to cushion the impact of gentrification. Mandatory inclusionary zoning will be implemented in rezoned neighborhoods by rezoned neighborhood, one at a time. It will not necessarily be exactly the same everywhere, but within each neighborhood, once enacted, it will be predictable, it will be as of right, and it will be required. The key theme that runs through this plan, however, is our commitment to expand the capacity for housing in all five boroughs by fostering diverse and livable neighborhoods. To fulfill this ambitious goal, the Department of City Planning, working with local elected officials, businesses, community organizations, and residents, will commence planning studies in 15 neighborhoods throughout all five boroughs where we believe the potential exists to greatly expand housing capacity. We recognize that this effort must be undertaken through ground up community planning that coordinates new development and density with appropriate infrastructure, other public improvements, and necessary city services. City planning working with other city agencies, including HPD and EDC, and parks, and others, will play an enhanced role in the city's capital budget planning process in order to better mesh the level and timing of the city's capital investments in neighborhoods with new residential development. I understand neighborhoods are frequently wary of increased density and indeed wary of change of any kind. City government has not always delivered on its promises. In fact, sometimes it has not even bothered even to promise the investments that must accompany neighborhood change. However, I believe that if we can appropriately coordinate capital budget planning 
With rezoning, neighborhoods will welcome the benefits that increased density can provide, particularly better retail opportunities, a livelier, healthy street environment, and affordable housing that will allow long-term residents to stay in their communities. Let me provide a template on how this can work. For the past two years, our Brooklyn office has been engaged in a planning process with the community in East New York, a vibrant, multicultural neighborhood that has been left behind even as many other parts of Brooklyn have thrived. This transit-rich area offers an easy 30-minute commute to Lower Manhattan and downtown Brooklyn and east to JFK and Long Island. Our planners have been out in the community meeting with all stakeholders and listening to their hopes and vision for their neighborhood. In close partnership with elected officials, community members, business leaders, and the Cypress Hills Local Development Corporation, we have developed a framework for growth and revitalization that can create the opportunity for thousands of units of new affordable housing, much needed retail and amenities, jobs and services, and that also addresses the physical infrastructure needs of the neighborhood. We have been engaged with our sister city agencies to ensure that our planning work comprehensively addresses infrastructure and service needs, access to jobs and training, and ensures that the people in the community can continue to be partners in the revitalization of their own neighborhoods. We believe East New York now welcomes increased density because it understands the benefits that it can bring. But we understand the city's obligation to produce the timely infrastructure and services increased density requires. We will be similarly engaged with communities throughout the five boroughs to identify other opportunities for growth and redevelopment. We will work towards shared goals of providing new housing options, essential services, neighborhood amenities, and economic development opportunities throughout the city, and in this regard, working very, very closely, particularly with our friends at the Economic Development Corporation. Vibrant mixed-use communities in which people live, work, and play are essential to the continued ability of New York City to attract and retain residents. The 2013 MAF survey on livability is a strong indication that we need to integrate arts and culture into neighborhoods outside of Manhattan. Community-based planning that takes into account neighborhood views as to where cultural activities can be incorporated into new developments, how to attract and retain a creative workforce, and plan for art and cultural equity must be essential components of our efforts. The tech and creative sectors, and increasingly the traditional manufacturing sector, are closely linked industries that the city is committed to reinforcing through the mayor's focus on attracting, increasing, and strengthening jobs for all New Yorkers and our continued support for investments in endeavors like the Brooklyn Navy Yard, where manufacturing, office, and creative industries are closely linked to nearby residential neighborhoods like Fort Greene, Dumbo, and Williamsburg. Indeed, that was exactly the goal of rezoning of this Hudson Square no neighborhood. All the boroughs need places where engineers, designers, entrepreneurs, production and educational institutions can thrive. I believe, you know, for the past 70 years, really since the end of World War II, the city's manufacturing policy has been defensive. It has been one of attempting to slow the rate of manufacturing decline. I think it's really time for us to go on the offensive, and I know that Kyle Kimball and EDC are doing so, and recognize the dynamic change that's taking place um, among and in many manufacturing businesses and neighborhoods, ones that have discovered the locational advantage of staying in New York. It is really time to create the physical and business environment that will allow these businesses to achieve their full potential to grow and thrive. In order to accommodate this growth, the public and the private sector must join forces to find appropriate geographic areas for these businesses to revise and, and for us to revise our land use policies accordingly. In my view, some manufacturing, high-tech businesses are not incompatible with workforce housing. Indeed, manufacturing and workforce housing in some circumstances can be mutually reinforcing. Co-location can reduce stress on our infrastructure requirements, 
by providing opportunities for workers to live near their jobs and create the kind of physical environment, including enhanced arts, culture, and public realm and retail that will make manufacturing areas more appealing to those who work there. Um, and I think this challenge is not a, uh, a question of compatibility of uses. We can figure that out. The challenge is, as Adam Friedman points out in his fine essay, for you, uh, innovating uh, jobs, is really in the disparity of land values and what different uses can afford to pay. And that's the tool that we have to figure, uh, figure out. Um, I'll just say in conclusion that um, I want to talk a bit about partnerships. I've spent most of my uh, life transforming neighborhoods from inside and outside government. Um, Counterintuitively, perhaps, it is sometimes easier uh, to lead government from the outside than from the inside. Um, but at the very least, these endeavors require committed institutions and leaders on both sides of the aisle, both on the public side, the private side, and indeed uh, on the not-for-profit side. Our city is complex. Uh, we mostly are receptive to change, but we all want rational and constructive change. And that can only be achieved by working together I look forward to working closely with MAS and with everyone in this room. This is an amazing collection of talent and leadership. Um, so together that we can achieve, I think, the goal that we, that we all share. So thank you very much and I look forward to the first time.